We have a real treasure here in Lexington. It's the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Kentucky, also known as OLLI at UK. That's O-L-L-I. I'm Tom Haley, and this is Bluegrass Region Voices and Views, where I have conversations with creative and inspiring people around the Bluegrass Region of Kentucky. This conversation is with Lee Edgerton. Lee is serving as the chair for the Ollie Lexington Advisory Board for the 2023 through 2024 term. We talk about its history and then the programming it offers, such as the Donovan Scholarship Series, the Donovan Forum Series, the courses, and how the teachers are selected. We'll also talk a little about Toastmasters and storytelling. Let's begin by getting to know a little about Lee. Drop in on our conversation after I've asked him where he was born and raised. I was born in Los Angeles, which comes as a surprise to many people and to me also. I I grew up with a real anti-California feeling. I had some cousins from California and they were sort of city slickers and what I consider my hometown and still consider it hometown today is Cuna, Idaho, K-U-N-A. And I tell people, and I'm amazed at the number of people that don't know that that's the center of the universe. You, you, can, you can connect everything to my hometown in, in my mind. I was preschool, probably four or five, when when we moved to CUNA. My father was farming with my grandfather. They had a dairy farm there, and that's that's what I consider my hometown. And I spent twelve years there in elementary and high school before going to the University of Idaho, where I got my bachelor's degree and started in graduate school. It was a town of about 450 people, as I recall. It was small enough, and in that time, in, in that part of the country, you didn't drive to a town and find a road sign that said, such and such town population, such mm. and such. It was this town and the elevation. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's a little different perspective, but uh, we didn't know streets. We went from the Jones house to the Murphy's and that sort of thing in, in directions. Uh, Interesting. Uh, well, but What brought you to Kentucky then? Well, to, just to follow that line... Uh, when I finished at the University of Idaho, I started in graduate school there. I started in graduate school because this was the time of the Cuban crisis, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. And my dream when I went to the university was that I was going to take genetics and I was going to breed the best herd of dairy cattle in the nation. And I was going to be a dairy farmer. And when I graduated, I realized I don't have the money to buy a dairy farm. I didn't feel like I wanted to continue all the things the way they were on my stepfather's dairy farm. Uh, My father had died and my mother had remarried subsequently. My stepfather was a very hard worker, and but he had more things going probably than he really could keep up with and I so I didn't want to continue the operation the way he was doing it but I realized I didn't have any right to tell him he he was successful I didn't have any right to tell him this Mm -hmm. needs to change and but I didn't have the money to start my own dairy farm and and I didn't uh, one of my mentors at the university said don't don't go into the military I, I think that was a 
mm-hmm. an error. I, I think there's a lot to be said for a military experience. Mm-hmm. But at any rate, I decided I would go to graduate school. And then I, another mentor said, you don't have any business going to graduate school where you have finished your undergraduate work. You're in a small department. You already know the mindset and philosophy of the people there. You need to go elsewhere. And this was shortly after Sputnik had gone up, Mm -hmm. and that had an effect also. Uh, There was a lot of interest in sending people to graduate school in the sciences. And so, whereas today, uh, students finishing their undergraduate work will send out many, many questionnaires, uh, queries to schools about the possibility of doing graduate work in their program, I went in and talked to my major professor, and he made a couple of phone calls, and I had offers from California, um, Cal Poly, and from Purdue. And I didn't write any letters. (laughs) (laughs) So I ended up going to Purdue, and from there I did a postdoc at Michigan State, and then I took a job with what was at the time Smith, Klein, and French. They became Smith Klein and then Smith Klein Glaxo, and I'm not sure what they are today. But I was working for them, and the market for livestock, which was the major fund funding source for my research uh, program, went dry, and so Smith Klein cut out. Our program, I say our program, Clifton Bale was the head of that program, and and I had to go elsewhere. Now, I could have stayed at Smith Klein, but I'd have been in sales, and it wasn't where I thought I wanted to be at that time. And so there was an opening at the University of Kentucky. I was fortunate enough to get it and, and came here in 75 and okay. have been here ever since. Okay, wow. Yeah, that's a history I did not know, uh, and, and we've known each other for a, quite, a, quite a few years. Well, uh, what's your first ever memory? I thought about that, Tom, and I'm not sure that I know what my first memory is, but I, I thought of two things, and, and they seem, well, one of them, I think you can see why that would stay in my mind. The other one, I'm not sure why it does, but... My earliest memory, my father was a a farmhand. We were living in a small tenant house, and combines were not as efficient as I'm sure they are today. And so when they combined the beans, a lot of beans would fall out. Uh, They would not be retained by the combine. And and I remember going out with my mother as as a very small child, and, and we were gleaning. You know, we were picking up the, the beans. And and okay. I don't know whether she did that thing. This is a, a good, uh, inexpensive way to get some food. <laughs> or if she thought this is a good way to keep Lee and Sharon busy <laughs> and and <laughs> doing things. And, and they'll be out in the field. They'll see their father working and, sure. and so forth. But anyway, I remember that. And I also remember in that same house, uh, just a small rectangular house, and a massive windstorm came up. And I know from hearing my mother talk about it that the owners of the farm had uh, talked to mother and said, would you like to come over to be in our house during this storm? It's going to be bad. And my mother said, no, we'll, we'll stay in, in the house. We'll be all right. And I remember we walked around from corner to corner of that house on the inside, watching the trees. And there were, there were trees on each corner of the house. And every one of those trees came down in that windstorm. Surprisingly, none of them came down on the house. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, so it... It's a memory of my mother being in control. Okay. I don't remember any sense of panic, mm-hmm. although I know part of the reason we were going around and watching those trees was to see where are these trees leaning yeah. and what is the likely outcome. Do I need to get out of here? 
but I, that wasn't my sense as a child. You know, this was this was fun. This was yeah. wow. This tree is going to go down. Well, and, the, you didn't and, think about it on your head. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Yeah, and yeah. and we're going to see it, and and yeah. so uh, that that's probably uh, one of my earliest memories. Sure. What was the first job you had where you actually got paid? I. I don't know, but I, the first job that really sticks in my mind, this was after my father's death. He died, I think I was in the second grade when my father died. And, and my mother, we had been living in a, a rental house. My, my father was, was uh, working with my grandfather. And then my father had taken a job to be a salesman for a dairy equipment company called Surge. I don't know if that rings a bell to you or not. But at any rate, he had gone back to Omaha for training uh, on their equipment. And while he was there, he died. And uh, so uh, my mother had uh, my sister and I, two young children, and she decided that it made more sense rather than renting this house that we were sort of renting temporarily um, to buy a, a house. And it was an older home. It had some things that needed to be done, and, and there needed to be some plumbing work done. There was a small crawl space under that house, and the, plum, the local plumber, who was a pretty big man, um, it was a tight fit <laughs> for him to get under there and, and change some of that. And he told my mother if... He said, I can bring my son along to be the gopher, go mm -hmm. out and get things from the truck. But if, if, you, if you can provide Lee to do that, I was about the age of his son, yeah. uh, that'll save me a lot if I don't have to crawl in and out yeah. every time oh, gosh, to get yeah. something. And, and so I did that, and, and he told my mother uh, when he was finished that that probably saved you $100 on your bill. Okay. And, uh, you know, that at that time, $100 well, was a lot of money, and not right. only to me, but to my mother. And so I had a real sense of pride, and I learned a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know why the chemical symbol of lead is PB. It's plumb bum. Huh. At that time, when plumbing connections were made they put some ochre around the joint and they poured lead in there oh uh, now i don't i'm sure there were other yeah. ways of doing plumbing earlier on but that yeah. lead was was used for plumbing okay. and, uh, so so i i learned some things and i remember at one point in time he was um, putting threads on the end of a pipe and he was out there cranking this threading yeah. uh, tool on, on the end of the pipe. And he said, would you like to do this? And I, I put my hands on it, and I couldn't pull it down. I jumped up on it. I didn't have the weight, the body weight, mm -hmm. to push it down as he was easily <laughs> doing this, you know. <laughs> uh, but, but I remember that is not only an experience where I felt like I was contributing to the family, mm -hmm. but it was an educational experience. This, sure. this fellow who was, who was a plumber, not, not a teacher, not a person that I had seen as an educator, mm -hmm. was an educator. Yeah. You know, he, I learned some things, and, and I learned that people who don't necessarily have degrees in education can teach you a lot. Sure. Well, great, great lesson to learn at, at an early age. So you uh, came to the University of Kentucky, and now you're retired from there. Tell us uh, a little bit about your career at UK and how long you've been retired. Yeah. Well, as I say, I came in in 75, and my assignment at that time was to develop systems to control the time of farrowing. That's the birth process in swine. Mm. Because pigs have litters, the smallest pigs in the litter are typically not as well developed at birth as the older pigs. So in in pig in in most this is maybe 
TMI, Tom, no, but, right. <laughs> but in many species, it is the fetus that sends the signal for birth that tells the maternal system it's time to deliver. I, I'm ready to go. But in litter-bearing species like pigs, where they may have a dozen offspring, that doesn't make sense because the first piglet that is ready to be born is going to be physiologically ahead of others in that litter. And so in, in pigs, the birth process is timed by the mother after she's been pregnant for so many days. And it's, it's rather specific. You can time that from one gestation to the next in a, in a sow, and, and it, it'll be the same number of days, maybe a day or so off from others in the herd. But for that sow, it, she's got it timed. Hmm. And, and so that meant that some of those pigs weren't quite ready to be delivered. Mm -hmm. and, um, so the goal was to figure out how the producers could control that so they could be in the farrowing barn and give those young, immature pigs the care that they needed to survive. Mm -hmm. So uh, the research was initially a major part of my duties, and teaching was a minor part. Over time, the swine industry changed so that the swine operations became very large and highly integrated. So uh, producers could have somebody dedicated to being in the farrowing barn, and they'd have a large number of sows ready to farrow at a given time. Hmm. And so the, the procedures that I was working on were, at, at that point, less needed by the industry than, than we had thought initially. And so I, I shifted more to teaching, then I spent a couple of times as the university academic ombud, uh, hmm. the person who was in charge of resolving issues between students and faculty where the oh. university didn't have any specific rules or where the specific rules didn't seem to apply to a given situation. So that was an opportunity for me to be involved more broadly across the university to meet faculty in mm -hmm. other areas and administrators as we tried to work these situations out. And it was... A, it was at times a uh, frustrating job because mm. obviously not everyone was pleased with the resolution. And, mm -hmm. and it wasn't my position to ultimately make the decision. We had a, an appeals board which ultimately made the decision. But many faculty and, and others perceived that the ombud had a lot of power, so if things mm. didn't go their way, they might be a little bit irritated at the ombud. Okay. But, but yeah. by and large, uh, people uh, appreciated what was being done, and, yeah. and in, in most cases, both faculty and students were happy with the effort that you yeah. had made on their behalf to help them work things out. How many years were you at UK? Uh, I retired in 2011. Oh, so, that long ago now. Uh, okay, wow. Yeah. And, and has retirement been good for you? Retirement has been very good for me, Tom, in many ways. I never thought I was so tied to my job that I couldn't retire. And I had thought for many years that 65 was a good time. It was sort of the standard age of retirement, and I thought if, if you haven't figured out what you want to do by age 65, <laughs> there's not much hope for you. So initially, I planned to retire in 65, and, and as the time got closer, uh, Jim Bowling, whom I don't know whether you the name's real familiar. Yeah. Jim was active at Southern Hills for a number of years, yeah, okay. and, and he was in the department, a person I have a lot of respect for. And Jim said, you're kidding me. You're not serious. You're not going to retire, are you? 
that was about the time of the housing bubble and, and hmm. stocks were going down and so forth. And another person who I had a lot of respect for, she had been the chair of uh, anatomy in the medical school. And she said, if you're unhappy, by all means retire. But if you enjoy what you're doing, this is not a good time to retire. <laughs> and I was enjoying it. And so mm -hmm. I stayed on for another three years. When I was 68, I realized I'm doing this because it's comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I probably need to make that transition while I'm still young enough to transition to something else. And so I, re I retired. That was 2011. And I was surprised, Tom. I really was surprised. You hear all these stories mm. about how difficult it is to retire and, and how the wife really doesn't want to have the husband around. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I was surprised. You know, you go from, from being a person that students are coming in to ask questions of to being a person where nobody's asking you anything. <laughs> and even Melinda, who I knew loved me and would be happy to have me around, was, was kind of happy to have me gone again. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. But, yeah. but I was fortunate uh, to have uh, friends, including the fellow who was best man at our wedding. And Archie was involved with the Ollie program at Nebraska. And he said, you need to get involved with the Ollie program at UK. And Melinda said, I have heard great things about Susan Bottoms' history classes. Turns out I had never taken a history class after high school. And so I took uh, some of Susan's classes. And, and, and what I found was retiring is a real challenge because you—, you can no longer be the person you were. You have to become someone else. But what I found is that the freedom to elect other activities is a real blessing. And getting involved in the OLLI program, getting involved in storytelling, and, and, and staying involved with the faculty, with the emeriti faculty, mm -hmm. uh, is a real opportunity. Well, let's let's get right into that, into the Ollie program. And uh, later, if we have time, we'll touch a little bit on Toastmasters and storytelling. But our, our main reason today to, to, to get together is to talk about the, correct me if I mispronounce this, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Kentucky. Is it, is it Osher or I, Osher? I say Osher. Osher, okay. I was, uh, I, and I, I, believe that's, I believe that's the way that... Mr. Osher okay, pronounces well, his name. Good. Well, me, me mispronouncing it will help emphasize the right way to say it, with, which is a long O. Yes. The Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, uh, known as the OLLI program. So you are currently, for the 2023-2024 um, season, the chair of the Lexington Advisory Board. That is correct. Well, if you would, uh, just... Tell us anything that uh, you could start out anywhere you want to with the OLLI program. I had sort of made a note that maybe you could talk about uh, how the OLLI program began, what its history is, that type of thing. But uh, just take it anywhere, any direction you want to go. Well, let's, let's start with the Donovan program mm -hmm. because that came first and that played a key role in the development of the OLLI program. But President Donovan, sometime in the 50s, and I don't know the exact date, attended a conference where they were talking about education for senior citizens and lifelong learning. And he became a real advocate of lifelong learning. He retired, and two presidents later, uh, John Oswald became the president. And I don't know the history. I, I don't know what happened in between between Donovan and Oswald was was Dickey. Mm -hmm. uh, you may know Dickey Hall mm -hmm. on campus. Sure. Dickey was the president. He, he was president for a very short time, so I, I don't know that history. Mm -hmm. But 
one of the senior faculty when I started in animal sciences told me that when Oswald was president, it was a time of, of great change at the University of Kentucky. And so one of the changes that took place was that Oswald initiated the Donovan program. Donovan had been a real advocate for this and mm-hmm. from when he first became interested in lifelong learning, but he continued. And so even though we're now two presidents later when the program originally started, it was Donovan who, who pushed that, and, and Oswald initiated it while he was president. So it started with, um, I think, I've, I've got the figure someplace, and I've, I've forgotten. I think, I think there were mm-hmm. 26 students maybe mm-hmm. the, the first year that they started the Donovan program. One of those people was Marguerite Simpson, mm-hmm. and she was very interested in promoting that. She, not only was she interested in some art classes, but she had the, the money and, and desire to support other seniors in their efforts. So he, she would assist with financial support occasionally and, and helping them with loans to get going. And when she died, I just read her, um, uh, not her obituary, but an article that came out in the Herald Leader uh, about her. When she died in her will, she gave $1,000 to this relative and $1,000 to that and a few thousand to a close friend and so forth. But she left the bulk of her estate to the University of Kentucky to set up the Donovan program. Oh, okay. Um, hmm. uh, or what was the Donovan program? It's the wording is such that it could be used to further education for senior citizens. Mm-hmm. And so we don't hear her name very often, but uh, she she played a role in the Donovan program. Started in '64 in '66. It was featured in Time magazine, and that led to national attention. And uh, Mr. Osher started out as a manager of his father's hardware business, Hmm. but he progressed to running what I think was the second largest savings and loan bank. It was in California, and I don't know if that figure means it was the second largest in California or the second largest nationally. But at any rate, it was, mm-hmm. it was a large bank, and, and he had a real interest in using his money while he was still alive, and he is still alive. Mm. But UK became the beneficiary of a couple of large grants from Mr. Osher's foundation. Uh, the first one in, I think maybe 77 for a million dollars and mm. then a subsequent one for a million dollars. So the program then took his name in response to his significant contributions. And he, he beyond those, he's made other contributions. But the UK Ollie program, the UK Lifelong Learning Program, really was not only an incentive for opportunities for senior citizens at UK, but was a model for programs that have developed since then. There are now 125 OSHER lifelong learning programs around the U.S., all of which are tied to a university in the state where they reside. Okay. Now, the the let me make sure that I'm saying this right, that the, the the Donovan Scholars Program, that's where senior citizens, uh, people of a certain age, I'm not sure if it, I think it might be 50 now. 65. Six, 65. That they can actually take University of Kentucky classes alongside uh, 18-year-old freshmen. Is that right? And, and they don't have to pay tuition. They pay for their books and fees and so on. Am I, am I sort of on track with you, that? You are right on track, Tom. Okay. That's 
that's the real benefit. Now, Mm -hmm. you do have to pay taxes. That's perceived as a taxable benefit. Okay. But you don't pay the tuition, (laughs) and as you probably know, and I don't know what the tuition is now, but Mm -hmm. it's substantial. Yeah. So it's it's a tremendous saving. So that started out at UK. The state legislature has now made that a program throughout the state. You can go to any state university if you're 65 or above and take classes I without paying did, tuition. I did not know that. Yeah. As part of the but, Donovan but, Scholars yeah, but Program. At, at you, I don't know that it's called the Donovan oh. Scholars at other okay. institutions. But, but at UK, it, it's still an active program, and, and that is run out of the OLLI office, uh, out of the mm-hmm. Office of Lifelong Learning. Okay. Uh, so we we still have, I I think I read someplace we've got maybe 125, 126 people enrolled in that this year. There are, there are over a thousand in the Ollie taking Ollie classes, okay. but the Donovan is still a very active program, and and mm. um, we've had a couple of people complete their degrees. So mm. you can you can complete a degree, in, including. Uh, up to and including getting a doctorate, we, we've had okay. we've had people in the uh, Donovan program who've received doctoral degrees. The Ollie program is not a degree-seeking program mm-hmm. that provides non-academic credit classes. Uh, so you you take a class, there are no uh, required tests. Mm-hmm. You pay a, a minimal fee for the class. And they're typically shorter, eight weeks or less in length, which mm-hmm. is good for people who are retired and may have other things that they want to do in a given semester. Sure, and and those classes are not in classrooms at the University of Kentucky. They're at various locations around the city, I think. That is correct, okay. yeah. And that's intentional. Mm-hmm. Uh, some OLLI programs in other states have their own buildings, and most of their classes are in that building. But at UK, we have intentionally spread them out, meet in churches, in mm-hmm. in other areas such as the libraries and so forth to hold the, mm-hmm. the classes. And part of that's because getting on campus can be a real challenge, mm-hmm. and finding a parking place close to a classroom is an even greater challenge right. yeah and in fact some of the classes are at the senior citizens center and yes and i t- attended one there that you were uh, facilitating on storytelling so mm-hmm. maybe we can swing back to that so what what are in these community courses the ones that are not the donovan scholar at uk uh, not not ones that are on the university of kentucky curriculum but the community courses, what, give us some examples of some of the types of classes. And if you need to look at the catalog, I've got, you all have a beautiful catalog. I mean, that is a first-class publication. So it, what are some of the classes? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that the catalog is a, a first-class publication, and it's also online. So many of our senior citizens now are operating online with, mm. with a lot of things. Well, I, I mentioned Susan Bottom. She is the first person that comes to my mind, and she, her background is in logistics. She worked for, I think, every branch of the military at some time in logistics, but she has a passion for history. She reads extensively, and she begins each of her classes, at least each of them that I have taken, by showing you a half dozen books that you might want to read if you're interested in this topic. And she will say, now this book is really extensive. If you want details and you want to be sure that those details are right, this book is for you. If you're interested in a general picture, this is a novel. It's not not historically specific. That mm-hmm. you can't be sure that the details that you're reading actually happen. But if you want a flavor for the history, this is a great book to read. And this one will give you a, it has excellent maps in it. You'll mm-hmm. get a, a feel for where this is taking place and so forth. So I, I was always amazed at her ability to talk about these mm-hmm. things. She tells me that she has a 
good ability to recall where she has read things. Mm -hmm. So she might not remember details, but she knows where to go to find those details. She she runs an excellent. She has groupies that <laughs> that sign up for her classes. Uh, we have other people that that are also well known. We have what we call out of the box classes, and one of our retired chemists had a course on fly fishing, hmm. for example. We have made a connection to the local computer society and. So they provide half dozen classes each term, ranging from how do you use the current windows mm -hmm. or how do you use your iPhone? How can you get more out of your iPhone to do different things that the iPhone is capable mm -hmm. of doing that perhaps you weren't aware of? Or how do you use your iPad? And, and so... They provide that for their membership, but they also provide it for members of Ollie at a, mm -hmm. at a reduced rate. And so those are options. We have courses that are related to physical fitness. You can do what's referred to as slow flow yoga. I, th I think Karen has been in, yes, in those yes. classes. She has, yeah. And I know we've harassed you and <laughs> tried to encourage you. To, but, but physical fitness, uh, there's the yoga, there's line dancing, there's uh, Tai Chi. I, I don't know whether we've got Tai Chi this semester or not, but, but things that keep people involved. This year we have a relatively new member of our group, Don Gash, who uh, retired from uh, UK's neurosciences program and, and he has a strong uh, sense of the importance of not only intellectual stimulation for us as we age but also physical fitness so he's teaching a class on nordic walking mm -hmm. uh, so we we have a range from intellectual things you can take some language classes you can take art classes a uh, number of history classes we have two or three film courses, uh, different genres of film that that you might be interested in that you can take where, where you'll watch a, f a classic film or a film in a particular area and then talk about it. We've got a, a number of uh, art courses where very knowledgeable people mm -hmm. are talking about artwork from a given time or a given artist and, and uh, so forth. So... Uh, a number of things that I think are really good. Uh, I'm involved in a writing SIG. SIG stands for a Specific Interest Group. And we have a number of those who are run by members. There's no charge to belong to those if you want to belong. The facilitator of the SIG is responsible for finding a space to meet and mm -hmm. And so they have some greater autonomy than other mm -hmm. courses, but they allow people with an interest in a particular area, such as writing or uh, perhaps a book club, to pursue interests in that area. Yeah, you know, there's a photography course that I'm really interested in. Yes, so, yes. So these are courses that last over a number of weeks, typically meeting, I think, one hour, one day a week for seven, eight weeks. But then besides that, I think I've got this terminology right. There's the Donovan Forum programs, and those are one-offs. I mean, I don't know if one-offs is the right way to say it, but they, they meet one time for an hour to two hours or so maybe and uh, on a specific topic with a special lecturer. Is that correct? Yes. The, okay. the forum meets weekly on Thursday afternoon, and uh -huh. right now we're meeting at the senior center, but we'll have maybe 12, a dozen, 13 of those each semester. They'll invite in people who have knowledge of a particular program that the committee thinks would be of interest to the Donovan uh, age group. Uh, it's not a credit class. Uh, we call it the Donovan Forum, but... It's open to the public, and you you don't mm -hmm. have to register. You're welcome to attend any individual class um, at the Senior Citizen Center, or you can get online to 
uh, view it online. But uh, they bring in some fascinating uh, people and some fascinating topics. At least I think they're fascinating mm-hmm. and typically draw a pretty good group. Well, that uh, so I learned something there. I didn't realize that to attend one of the Don- Donovan Forum lectures that you do not have to be a member of uh, Ali, and you do not have to to pre-register. As a membership in Ali, you is required to take these courses that last a number of weeks. But it's only uh, fifty dollars per term, and there are two terms a year. F- fifty dollars right? per year. Oh, per so year. That, oh. that gets you into the fall, spring, and summer. All three. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now there's a there's a course fee for each of the classes, mm-hmm. and that varies from like twenty to thirty dollars or something. Yeah, like that. <laughs> on up uh, yeah. the chorus, which is one of the most popular programs, mm-hmm. is I think forty something mm-hmm. now because they have to buy music and pay the royalties and yeah. so forth. So there's a little more involved in that one than than in some of the courses, but it's still relatively inexpensive. Okay. So that we've, there's the Donovan Scholars Program, which is where people over age 65 can take University of Kentucky classes, and then it that's spread around the state, and uh, get class credit or just, what's it called, monitor the class? Yes, they can audit, the, audit class the class if they, if they wish. They don't have to take it take for, credit. for credit. And then there are the community courses. These are the ones that last maybe six, eight weeks type of thing. And then there's the Donovan Forum. And these are in-person, but also there are some that are in-person and on Zoom, and then some that are Zoom-only, I believe. Is yes. it, am I right yes. about okay. that? Yes, that's one of the positives that came out of the COVID hmm. years. Uh, we had to transition to Zoom, and as we've gone back to in-person classes, we've realized that some people really need that Zoom connection. So we, we have in-person classes, we have Zoom classes, and we have hybrid classes. Mm-hmm. That allows our members who don't physically have the ability to get out to attend an in-person class to still take some classes. And mm-hmm. they may be watching an in-person class in a hybrid setting or they may sign up for something that is just a, a, yeah. a Zoom connection. But that has also allowed us to spread the program. And I mentioned Marguerite Simpson earlier on. One of the things she said is she wanted her money to be used to expand the programs. And and the use of Zoom connections now has really helped us do that. So mm-hmm. our writing group... Uh, for two or three times now, we've had a very active member over in Louisville. Oh. Uh, she gets on via Zoom and, and some others who are in different areas. Mm-hmm. Uh, this this term, for the first time, we have combined the Lexington and the Moorhead catalogs because we recognize that people who are in Moorhead can take a class in Lexington without driving to Lexington. Mm-hmm. And sitting here in Lexington... I can sign up for a class in Moorhead, yeah. and I don't have to make that trip. Yeah. Uh, so w- we are hoping to expand utilizing the university's extension service to reach even more people in the state than we have in the past. Okay. Even some of the exercise, the, the yoga class you're talking about that, that you were taking and that Karen still takes, my wife still takes, that's even available on Zoom. That's it's right. pretty amazing. That's right. <laughs> well, we've uh, talked about how the, how the OLLI program is set up and so on, but you're here because uh, you're the chair for this. So tell us what you do as the chair of the Lexington Advisory Board, and how, how did you get that role, and what do you do? Well, you've probably heard the joke about the... Uh, faculty member who didn't show up for a faculty meeting and found out he was chair. <laughs> I know how that works. <laughs> uh, there, there's a, an aspect of that that 
I, I became chair because I was willing to be talked into it. But for me, it's, it's an opportunity to better understand the program. And I'm, I have been chair once before mm-hmm. when we had a different director and so forth. So this is going to be a little different experience. But I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I, I feel like I am still learning. The, the chair operates the advisory board. And I would want to emphasize that we are an advisory board. Mr. Osher made very clear as he was setting up all the programs throughout the country, throughout the U.S., that they were to be under the guidance of a university. Hmm. So we are an advisory board. The university makes the decisions on what we will do ultimately, but they take very seriously input from the students, the senior members of the OLLI program mm-hmm. and the lifelong learning program. So it, I, I don't mean to sound like we have no power. Ultimately, mm-hmm. we are not running the show. We are just mm-hmm. an advisory board. Mm-hmm. But we, we try to keep tabs on, on what people are thinking, what works and what doesn't work, and advise the administrative people on on that so that they're making decisions that are compatible with the thoughts of the older people. So uh, I'm, I'm the person who runs the monthly meetings, and we have a number of, of different parts of the advisory board. We have people who work on developing travel. We have people who develop the for, uh, forum programs. We have people who are responsible for looking at the curriculum. Uh, We have on the curriculum committee probably 10 people who Mm -hmm. have different perspectives and they go over each of the class proposals and say, yeah, this is good or we think this person needs to more fully develop their syllabus so that, Mm -hmm. that they know what's happening or this syllabus sounds really great, but we think the instructor is just a little bit naive. We don't use that word when we're <laughs> when we're talking to the instructor, but we we think they've got more here than they can possibly get through, particularly with a group of older students, many of whom will want to comment in class about different things. Right. <laughs> and and we try to provide guidance so that new instructors sort of understand what they're getting in for that they may not have understood when perhaps they were a, a university faculty professor themselves or they were teaching in the secondary school system. And they think they know how to teach, but they may not be prepared for the way we operate as senior citizens. Sure. And, and uh, so we, we try to, to assist with all of those things Sounds like a full-time job. <laughs> well, it's probably going to take more time than I thought when I naively said, yes, I'll be chair. And, and your term starts the start of the first of I August? Start, I it? started in July. In July, And okay. it will run to, to the end of June. Okay. Well, sure glad you're in charge of the program here or in charge <laughs> of the, the advisory board here. Well, we have about 10 minutes left to for our podcast conversation here. Before I have a couple other things that I want to ask you about, is there anything else you'd like to say about the OLLI program? Well, I would just like to emphasize two things. One is that we probably have not recognized the contribution of Marguerite Simpson as Mm -hmm. much as we should have. We've Mm -hmm. focused on OLLI, and we are certainly indebted to Mr. Osher Mm -hmm. for supporting this program but marguerite simpson was important in that in that also and i want to also point out that we really are trying to expand the program to extend ourselves beyond just the university community and the community in moorhead at one point we had a a group active in somerset but they kind of faded with uh, the COVID issues and so forth and 
but we're hoping to expand and we're hoping to utilize the university's extension service to reach more people across the state of Kentucky and nationally. We've, we've got some instructors now who are offering via distance uh, classes for our OLLI program who are in other states. Okay. And, and we think the opposite can also be true, that we can reach people as we are now all much more familiar with virtual mm-hmm. learning opportunities. We, we hope to expand our classrooms to the, the rest of the nation. Sure. Well, in the outro that I'll do later, I'll be very specific about how people can find out more about the OLLI program, what the website all uh, is, and I'll also have that in in the uh, written show notes as well. Well, again, we, I'm sure the community really appreciates uh, what you're doing, and uh, I'm sure you'll have a fun year. I'm sure you're, you're starting in the you're, you're not in the middle of it yet. You're a couple months in, but. So uh, we met, you and I met, at Sunrise Toastmasters in the early 90s, I believe it was. Uh, Tell us a little bit about how you got involved there. And I heard one time, I don't know if this is true or not, but that your wife wanted you to get like a storage building to keep all of your trophies in or something (laughs) like that because they were (laughs) cluttering up the house. But just tell us a little bit about Toastmasters. (laughs) It is true that some of my trophies are now sitting down in the basement, uh, sort of out of sight and so forth. I got involved in Toastmasters because Wilbur Fry, one of my colleagues Mm -hmm. in the College of Agriculture, who was not that well known to me at the time, but he was active in Sunrise Toastmasters, and they were trying to build their membership, and he said, I think you would benefit from this. And I thought, I had heard about Toastmasters, but didn't really know much about them. I thought, you know, this is something I think I can do. And it was a time when I was, I wouldn't say a midlife crisis, but I was, I was struggling a little bit to, to find venues to increase my sense of well-being. Mm-hmm. And, and so... I, I took Wilbur up on his invitation. I went to the Toastmasters meeting. I found it a delightful community. You know, I, I didn't really talk about this with respect to the OLLI program, but it's not only intellectual and physical, but there's also a social aspect. And those three things are really key to success for those of us who are older and particularly those of us who are retired. Uh, we have to fulfill those things. And Toastmasters did that for me. It gave me a, a supportive group that was willing to um, help me become a better communicator. And that was important to me in my UK position to mm-hmm. learn how to communicate more effectively with these students, so particularly as I became more distant age-wise hmm. from the students. But I, I still remember the, the first evaluation I got. It, it was just hmm. glowing, uh, huh. you know, and, and made me feel like, wow, you know, this is something I can do. Yeah. Uh, and Toastmasters, as you know, encourages you to be positive in, mm-hmm. in your evaluations. And, mm-hmm. and I was... Uh, involved not only in teaching but as I mentioned with the academic ombud where being able to communicate with people and and to make them feel like they were valued and so forth was an important part of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So Toastmasters has been a real benefit to me not only while I was working but it was one of the activities I decided to remain active in when I retired because I recognized that I needed that weekly reminder of how one communicates mm-hmm. and I I think I'm a, I don't think I 
I know based upon the Myers-Briggs test that I'm an introvert. Hmm. And most university faculty are. And it is easy for us to isolate ourselves with a nose and a book and let the rest of the world go by. But we also know that that's not good for any of us. Mm -hmm. We need to connect with a larger group. And Toastmasters has been one of the ways that I've been able to do that. And you're a member of the Sunrise, Sunrise. Club, meets at 6.30 a.m.? 6.30 a.m., a yeah. grand time to start the day. Yeah, on Tuesdays, um, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you, you are still welcome any Tuesday yeah. morning you'd like to join us. We'd yeah. love to see you talk. Yeah, I was a member of that club in the early 90s when we met at Shoney's on Nicholasville yeah. Road yeah. at that time. Where do you meet now? We now meet in the uh, Myrtle Weldon Suite which is in the E.S. Good Barn, mm. just off Farm Lane. Okay. Uh, there's parking uh, in the parking lot there. It uh, now houses the mm -hmm. alumni uh, program for the College of Agriculture. So okay. you, can, you can park right there in, in beside the building uh, each Tuesday morning. Well, maybe I'll get back over there sometime. We'll see. I get up at six, get up at five o'clock, I guess. So, storytelling has also been a big part of your life, and still is. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you got involved with that and what you're doing with that these days. Well, one of the things that we learn is that when you retire, you have to fill the voids that are coming in your life that your job filled, and. So as I retired, the university very uh, thoughtfully had a program that lasted, I think, maybe a couple of days. And I, I was busy with other things. I didn't get to all the program, but I did get to hear some retirees talk about what they were doing. And I realized that I didn't have that set up. I wasn't prepared in that sense. So... Hmm. I was looking for something that I could do, and the library had a flyer promoting storytelling for a group that at the time was called Spellbinders. That was a program started out in Colorado by a, a lady who was in her 50s, and she had a degree in theater. And so she gathered a group of senior citizens together and taught them how to tell stories. And we as spellbinders, and subsequently now we call ourselves Lexington Storytellers, we go into elementary schools and tell stories to the kids, fairy tales, folk tales, mm. occasionally some, some other stories, but, but that's our primary mission. We also tell to senior groups. And we have some storytellers who tell at, at Cardinal Hill to a day mm -hmm. care program for seniors that have some mental issues. We have a, people who tell routinely to best friends, another senior daycare hmm. system, and uh, in a few other cases. But primarily, we tell stories. And relative to the students in elementary school, storytelling is a great way not only for them to learn something about the culture that we are all influenced by, but also the data suggests that when students listen to stories and get involved, they are more inclined to read, and so mm -hmm. they become better readers, and they become better writers. And so, for example, the students that I tell to at Maxwell Elementary, which is a Spanish immersion hmm. program, have at the end of the year, presented me with stories that the students have written themselves. And you can see how they've incorporated bits and pieces of the stories that they've been hearing. Now, I'm sure the teachers are also sharing some stories with them, but, mm -hmm. but you can get a sense that this really is a contribution to the educational system in Fayette County. So uh, it's it's a big thing. It's it's big not only because I think it's making a contribution, but because it makes me feel wonderful. Yeah, I tell at not only at Maxwell but at uh, Wellington Elementary, 
And Wellington is very close, so sometimes I ride my bike over there. Mm. And I've told Melinda, I it didn't matter what the vehicle was. I could have floated home. <laughs> oh, that's it's that moving to yeah. be there with those yeah. kids. Wow. And you know, yeah. and I've heard other tellers say this also. You yeah. go into the into the class, yeah. into the building, and the and the students say hi to you, oh, you know, yeah. because they know the storyteller. Wow, that it's, I might have to attend sometime just yeah. to maybe I could record one of your sessions. Well, you uh, ought to join us as yeah, a storyteller, <laughs> Tom. It's just one day a yeah. month uh, yeah. to commit to that. Well, before uh, I get to the bluegrass region highlights, there is one question that I um, really meant to ask you about Ollie and, and it just now came back to me is how do you find your instructors for your courses and are you are you looking for instructors what's the process of becoming one Tom I am thrilled that you I forgot to mention that also and it, it's one of the key things I really wanted us to focus on because we do need more instructors as the program grows now we were down as were most Ollie programs during COVID we lost a lot of people but we are building back now and of course the more people you get the more offerings are needed so we are always looking for instructors and we Get them by encouraging current members to think about offering a class. We get them in conversations with people. Uh, you run into Joe and John Doe, and John Doe is retired, and he's looking for something to do. And you say, hey, have you thought about teaching a class in Ollie? So, for example, I might say, you know, Tom, I think there would be a real interest in people learning how to build bridges. And I can see how this might be not only a discussion of physically what's the process of building a bridge, but how that relates to the bridges we need to make socially. Hmm. And, and I could see a beautiful class there. And I, and I know you understand the process <laughs> of, of creating pre-stressed concrete and that's fascinating and there are yeah. people in ollie that would like to know how you do that and how that how that connects to putting a bridge together um, and yeah. and we are trying to build bridges social bridges also and i right. i just see that and have you thought about developing a course for ollie interesting and <laughs> And I, if I catch you at the right time, you might say, you know, I think I might Do think that. about yeah. that. So if someone is listening, uh, hear, hearing what, what you're saying right now about becoming an instructor and they feel a little bit moved to learn more about that, what, what should they do next? Well, uh, first of all, I would encourage them to get involved with Ollie. Come, come to a Donovan Forum. That's a, we often use the Donovan Forum for people who are thinking about teaching and, and we say, why don't, you, why don't you give us a discussion for one hour, you're talking 45 minutes plus questions, about your area of expertise and you'll get a feel for how the audience might react to that. Mm -hmm. It'll give you a chance to just try it out and so that's, that's good, I yeah. would encourage people to come get a, a feel for what we are like as as lifelong learners by attending the Donovan Forum. But then get involved with the Ollie. And on our website, there is a place where you can go uh, to look for in being a future instructor and you can find the, oh, okay. the form to fill out and, uh -huh. and submit. And that goes to the curriculum committee and and they mm -hmm. will look at it and, and say, uh, this, is, this is great. We think it, it mm -hmm. might be improved if you would add this. Mm -hmm. or we, we think that you have a great idea, but we think you're optimistic about how much you can cover in a term. Why don't you think mm -hmm. about taking this section, starting there, and then maybe mm -hmm. offering another course in this related area? Okay. But, but those forms are available on the OLLI website. Great, and there'll be a link 
in the show notes. Well, super. Well, I appreciate you filling us in on on the uh, Osher, Osher Long O program and Ollie. And now we've come to the Bluegrass Region Highlights. I always close my show with these two questions, Lee. So number one, what's your favorite restaurant or coffee shop in Kentucky? So in the Bluegrass state of Kentucky, where do you like to go and hang out? Or maybe where do you like to take an out-of-town guest to show off our local culture? That's a tougher question for me than you probably thought when you asked yeah. it. You th- probably thought that's a real softball. Yeah, I did. I, I am not much for eating out. Okay. Uh, Never have been, but I, I, I think of a few things that I, mm-hmm. I think are particularly good. We like to take people to Joseph Beth Bookstore, mm-hmm. and and we still find that a, a fascinating place to hang out occasionally. And, and Melinda will usually say, okay, you've got this much time, and that's it. <laughs> you got to <laughs> quit at that point. But that's a place that we like to take out of town guests. To, we, to the cafe there, you mean? Or well, just to, to the, the bookstore. Yes, right, just, right. Just yeah, to, sure. To get a feel for the, the bookstore. We also like to take people down to Shaker Town. Mm-hmm. Uh, we think that's a bit of local culture that many people have not seen. And if it's possible, we will fit into a meal there mm-hmm. in Shaker Town. I think that's an interesting experience for people as right. well. So that that kind of fits into the restaurant. But if if I knew somebody uh, that I thought we ought to get together and go eat at a restaurant here locally, we would take them to DV8. Mm-hmm. Have, you, have you been to DV8? I'm, I'm going to be there tomorrow morning at 1030. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are really fascinated by the program that yes. Rob Perez and his wife, Diane, have put together. Tell us about that for a moment here. Well, Rob uh, has been involved with restaurants for some time, and he recognized that that the lifestyle of people working in the food industry is often not a positive one. They they work until sometimes until late at night when they're f- finished going off work and they want to just relax a little bit. There's nothing available except a late night bar, and so it's easy for people to get drinking too much. And of course, as you probably know, we've got a lot of people that end up because of an injury getting placed on an opioid for pain, mm-hmm. and they become addicted to it. And so we've got a lot of people who have addiction problems. And, and Rob faced this himself, and he's very open about that. And so they have, have recognized that one of the real problems for people, once you've had this and once it's on your record, is finding employment, getting back into the work field. So they have, through the DV8 restaurant, provided employment opportunities for people. And they really, they do an excellent job of training. They understand what those individuals mm-hmm. are going through. They understand that it is difficult. Uh, they, they put pressure on them to do the job right. It's, it's not a, oh, these poor people, mm-hmm. we're going to help you back. Uh, they're, they're hard on them, but they, mm-hmm. they help them to regain a career opportunity or to start a career opportunity if they haven't had one. And we think that they are doing things that Melinda and I can't do because we don't have the background. We don't Mm -hmm. understand Mm -hmm. what that is. But we know it's a serious issue in society. So uh, we uh, had friends visiting from Idaho this uh, summer, uh, past fall, and and uh, we took them to Shakertown, and we took them to Deviate, and oh. they were blown away 
uh, yeah. by the the service oh, and deviate. Yeah. And the food, and they make yes. it right. They're baking yes. and everything. Yes. Yeah, I'm looking forward to having a meeting with a friend there tomorrow morning at 1030, the newest one, the one out, uh, I guess that's out on 3rd Street, not not the one on South Broadway, but yeah. they're both great. Well, yeah. well, that's a great Bluegrass Region highlight tribute right there to to what Ron has done with that. Well, Lee, I so uh, appreciate your friendship since the early 90s and your work for the Lexington Advisory Board at Ollie, and uh, we'll, we'll have to find a, a reason to get together and do a, another podcast in the future. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. It's been a pleasure. Appreciate it. I encourage you to visit the Ollie website at www.uky.edu slash Ollie and consider participating in a forum or class. You can find show notes and links on my website at www.bluegrassregionvoicesandviews.com slash Ollie. Now a quick commercial for me. I'm working on a service to help senior citizens record a few stories from their lives to share with family, friends, and descendants. I'm calling it Your Story in Your Voice. I have a web page under construction with some experimental videos posted there talking about the program. I'll be reshooting the final videos this fall, and I hope to go live with this service this December 2023. I'll announce the launch date once I have all my ducks in a row. Right now, I'm just locating the ducks. Don't forget to check out the Ollie program, especially if you are anywhere over age 50. There's a lot there for us. Thanks for listening.